Okay, I think we're ready. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. well, welcome everybody. And um, I'm very excited once again to have Penny Kelly here yeah. with us today. It's an honor and a pleasure to be with you, Penny. There's a lot of excitement you know? you're here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tremendous excitement. So um right. We're in the midst, of course, <laughs> of a lot of huge change. And um, would you like to just start out maybe talking a little about your upcoming book, The Revival, or any anything that's coming up for you at the moment, maybe? Should we just start there, Paul? Okay. Um, yeah, I think, well, let me start by saying we really don't have a whole lot of choice anymore. Um, I, I just, I'll just mention, I have four children. Um, they're in their 50s, every single one of them. And then half of the people that are writing to me are saying, I, I either need a new job or I got fired from my job uh, because of circumstances out there. Um, or my job went away and now I'm, you know, sitting here twiddling my thumbs. And, and that whole thing about looking for jobs is really going to force a lot of people to consider, okay, now what? Um, and, and when I, when it's hitting me from all of my children, they're all like, they're really successful at what they've been doing. Um, and they are in this place where they have to reconsider, do I need to do something different, something else? And the answer is yes. And so that's pushing us to create a new earth. Um, and I think the, um, I started, oh gosh, now I should have, I probably should have reviewed my notes before I came on today. But um, I'm going to say that it was a couple of years ago that I was asked by some of my people who are not from um, this place, they're not from earth. Um, but they've been here a long time. Um, they're just different from us. They asked, would you help to create a new earth? Um, and I was not at all certain how to go about doing that and thought, well, yeah, sure. I'll be happy to do that. And then later thought, what the heck? <laughs> um, I'm not, uh, so, um, so I started by saying, by remembering that I had gone way back in the beginning of Kundalini. Um, there was a point, there was three years where I was not able to sleep at all because consciousness was on and it was on fire all the time. And, um, and so I would leave the body every night and go out and sit on the roof um, because I wasn't familiar with OBEs. I didn't know anything about metaphysical stuff. Um, and I, I would just float up to the roof and I would sit there and I learned a lot about what goes on at night with animals. <laughs> and, um, and I would watch uh, what was going on out on the bay. Um, and one night, these three, I could, I, we were just down the road from Selfridge Air Force Base. And I could see these three lights off in the distance. And I thought they were the lights on an airplane coming in. And that, um, and I, a little bit later, I'm like, I don't hear that plane. And I'm looking <laughs> and, and I'm watching those three lights and I'm thinking, that doesn't really look like an airplane. What is that? And I kept watching it. It turned out to be three beings of light that were coming to me and they, they kind of stopped right over my head and, and said, come with us. And I didn't have anything else to do. So I reached up my hand, they reached down and I grabbed on, the two of them grabbed my hands. And I swear to God, it was like becoming a Russian doll. I forget what the name is of those dolls where you, you open one and then there's another one and another one. And that's how I felt. Like they were pulling me out of a whole series of bodies. And and I was kind of like Star Wars, you know, streaks of light going by. I was at warp speed <laughs> or something like that. And then um, 
and then I saw a planet up ahead and I thought, okay, you know, that, that looks like it's in the way. Well, we ended up slowing down and landing on that planet. And, um, and I was introduced to some of the people there and, um, and I went back there. I've been back there now. Well, they took me there three or four times. Um, and then I went once, I accidentally went there on my, on my own once. And it was a stunning planet. You know what the most exciting thing about it was? It was, an, uh, and I couldn't figure out why this was so. It looked just like Earth. Exactly like planet Earth. The sun, the sky, the grass, the flowers, you know, the buildings. We went into a city. Um, the big difference, big difference with that experience um, and the experience here was that everything, and I do mean everything, every blade of grass, every pebble um, was communicating. And I remember when I was landing, when we were slowing down and, and landing on the planet, the whole planet was, you know, oh, she's here. Welcome. And I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, it was just the most unusual experience. It was very powerful. And then I had a tour through the city where every single window pane and brick and, and uh, you know, beam, eye beam or whatever, the sidewalk uh, was alive and you could communicate with it. It was an astounding experience. And then... Um, that was the first visit there. And the second visit was I went out into the, we went out into rural areas. Um, and, and what I saw over there was just, we went into this garden. Um, and you could see that everything growing in the garden was light. And you could watch the light actually moving around and doing its thing. Um, and then the third visit was... Uh, um, I can't remember the, where we actually went because the last experience of that was so powerful. The, um, there was somebody who was new to that place, um, not as new as I was, had been there a while, but um, the, whoever, wh whoever it was, he got upset um, for some reason instantly. The minute he got upset and got angry, the entire place just stopped what they were doing and focused on him, sending him love, uh, surrounding him with light. Everything became very, very silent. And we were near this person and I was watching all of this and he was stewing and chewing and, and he was mostly like talking to himself. Um, and, and you, you, we watched him talk himself right through the whole process of being angry and why was he angry and was that really any reason to be angry and what could he do about that and maybe he should just relax, <sighs> took a breath, you know, and, and everybody was just celebrating after he finally got past the anger. And I was so impressed by that. <laughs> I was like, oh, wow. Um, and so those were my first three visits. And the last visit, they said, um, would you like to stay? You are welcome to stay. And I had children and I said, ah, I really, I can't. I have children. Um, they, they're they young yet. You know, they. I think they were like 10 to 14 or 10, you know, maybe nine, something like that. Um, and so I came back, but it was just a phenomenal experience. So when I was invited to help create the new earth, I remember that experience and I ended up going back there and have made many trips back there over the last year. And I kind of think of that as the new earth because it looks just like, just like what we have here. And um, in almost every detail, except for the, these factors. There's absolutely no sickness. There's absolutely no um, people who are overweight 
or who are having difficulty with their bodies. There's nobody angry. There's no trash. Not one bit of trash or waste. It was as clean and beautiful as, as, you, as a picture. <laughs> if you painted a picture, left out all the garbage. Um, that it was just an amazing place. And, um, and there was, there was no anger that people communicated. They were patient with one another. They were thoughtful and deep. And there were, when they were dealing with, um, a question about, um, let me make something up here. Um, how should we, or how could we, or how might we do or achieve something, um, there was no rush to do that. And there was a lot of input and then, um, they would come up with something and then they would say, well, what's the long-term effect of that? And so then they go through another whole round of input and then they would say, well, um, do we have anybody willing to support that? And then people would come forward. And then finally, I think there were a couple other rounds that I don't remember right now. Um, but they would come up with a project and the people who were interested would carry out the project um, and would communicate with others. Well, we need this and we need that. I remember there was no money. There was um, no end to what you needed. It was a life of abundance. And, and so my own definition of abundance uh, was changed from that point forward to be abundance is the ability to manifest whatever you need when you need it, not be collecting stuff, you know, and hoarding and all that in case. So um, that whole thing about uh, new earth was, that was where I started. That was back in 80, 81. Um, and, and that really is where I have gone back to now. I have developed a house there. I have, um, an apartment there in a beautiful city, beautiful city. It's an urban setting, but there's not very many people there. Um, and the, the key, um, everything has to be beautiful. Everything. There's no uh, money. So therefore it doesn't matter if you want, um, you know, diamond glasses or diamond, diamond staircase or, you know, mother of pearl decorating your wall or whatever. It's the materials are there and they have technology that would knock your socks off. Um, and they have access to that kind of technology because they are so mindful of what's what needs to happen so that's how the new earth started for me and um and then um i should probably stop and give you a chance to ask a question if you have a question <laughs> it's it's riveting would rather you didn't stop but tiffany is asking will we see that earth in this lifetime penny um i'm not sure i it's there and I can go to it. Anybody else can go to it as well. Um, you, uh, one of the things when when the beings in that place said to me, "Would you like to stay?" Um, and I'm thinking about my kids. They also made the statement, "You would have to change everything that you think about how life should be." And at the time, I really didn't pay any attention to that comment because I was so caught up with but I have kids, <laughs> you know, what am I going to do with my kids? Um, I'm not leaving my kids. And, and so there was this um, realization that, okay, I could go there. I just would need to have a period of learning, ad adaptation to the kind of thinking and the kind of attitude that you need there. Um, and that would be really all that would be required. Um, so I think if you want to go there, you have to learn how to raise your frequencies. So, um, mm -hmm. that's, you know, maybe easier said than done. If we don't have technology that we can put on that says, okay, your brainwave state is, um, you know, is, is it 
Is it still at 12 cycles per second or is it at 200? You know, that kind of thing. So, um, so I'll continue with my story. Um, <clears throat> I think the, um, probably the next, you know, once I started with this, okay, how do I build a new earth? Um, I was chewing on that um, and I was writing uh, Consciousness and Energy, Volume 4, which was Trump, the sting, the catastrophe cycle, and consciousness. And, and so I go through this whole thing about recognizing what Trump is doing. <clears throat> and then I, I get to the, you know, I'm writing and I'm realizing, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> hang on, let me get a drink. Mm. Okay. So I'm realizing in this, as I'm writing, <clears throat> that there's this cyclical catastrophe that we go through on planet Earth. There are these cataclysms that recur regularly. And if you're living on the surface of the planet, which most people are not, um, on other planets, they don't live on the surface. You can't live on the surface of a planet that's, you know, minus 200 degrees Kelvin. It just isn't very comfortable. Um, and so people live inside the planet. And because we do not really understand the, the construction of a planet, um, we, you know, we here on the surface think it's solid in there and it's not. Um, and we think that it's dark in there and it's not. So um, that's a whole separate conversation. But um I'm writing this book and I get to the, the, you know, I'm like, okay, how do I conclude this book? And I happen to get on the treadmill because um, I, you know, work out regularly. And I come across this uh, video about the regular cataclysms that occur and that there's one coming and that it occurs every 12,068 years. And we're now 12,068 years is in 2040, maybe, something like that. <laughs> and it has a, a leeway of maybe 100 years either way. So anytime, anytime this cataclysm could happen. And so I'm like, oh, oh my gosh. And at, right at that same time, I'm studying history, just kind of, you know, not very um, aggressively like I am now. But um a lot of pieces came together, all the stories of the uh, Mexican people, the Mayan people, about the um, time of the fifth sun and the fourth sun. And before that, we had the third sun. Um, you know, that never made sense to me before until I realized that this catastrophe that happens involves the sun. The sun swells. And then it, it goes poof and it, it it kind of, it does an electrical discharge. It's like a giant electrical sneeze. And when it does that, it accelerates the solar wind um, and pushes everything between us and the sun right at the earth. And, um, and that's that huge compression heats up the atmosphere on the side of the planet facing the sun and the temperature gets to be like 2000 degrees Fahrenheit um, and everything burns up. And so that cleans off one side of the planet. And then 17 hours later, when the other side has rotated around, all of the material that was in space between us and the sun comes hitting, um, just pummeling, you know, just, you know, I forget how many hundreds of miles per second that stuff is moving. And it sort of pulverizes everything on the surface. And um, and there's, for the next 30 or 40 years, it's cloudy. There's hardly any sunshine. Nothing grows. A lot of things die that weren't killed outright. And we start fresh. And I, when I read that cycle, um, and I had enough science to understand it, it was like, oh, MG, 
so my thought was we the only solution that can save us is our consciousness to move to another dimension a higher frequency where all the physical stuff doesn't impact us and so i'm i'm closing out that book volume four with this um you know we need to build a new earth and we at least need, need to raise our consciousness um and and we need to um, be aware that there's not a whole lot of time left to learn how to do this um and and so on and so forth so um so i i tell about the night of the red sky in the back of that book and i have a acquaintance that i met through the through dr levengood and um, while I was finishing the writing of volume four, I thought I'm going to contact her and see if she minds if I tell her story. Um, cause she had, was somebody who was always in touch with ETs. Um, and she was, I, I don't know how old she was, but I thought she was an adult, but I'm not sure about that now. Um, and her name is Landy, Landy Mellis. And she has a book out called, um, I think beyond the sky, something like that. And, um, and it's a, a very good story of all of her ET communications. And so I wrote to her and said, do you mind? And she wrote back and said, no, go ahead. And here's some of the detail that you have wrong. Um, correct that. So I did that. And then when the book was in print, I sent her a copy as a thank you. And she read it and she wrote back immediately and she said, oh my gosh, I have been asked to help create a new earth as well. Because I mentioned the creating of a new earth um, in that book. And so we started comparing notes about how that happened with her. Very, very similar. Um, and so long story short, um, we have gotten word just in this last probably eight, nine months that, okay, it's complete. Now teach people how to get there. <laughs> and I'm like, huh, okay. Well, we really, I, we really need some technology that shows what is the brainwave doing? What, what's your frequency? Um, and so anyway, I continue to teach um, so that people will possibly figure it out and I, at least understand that your consciousness cycles and um and so this so in the process of um how do i say this in the process of visiting the new earth i got to thinking um i've been other places uh other uh, planets other dimensions other worlds um in courtesy of my my own people um and the, and the team that's here working to evolve consciousness, uh, that there's really quite a team here. Um, and, and so I was thinking, well, after reading about the, um, the period of the fifth sun, I think the, the Mayans, um, I think it's the Mayans, talk about the fifth sun and they had to go inside the earth to live. So I got to thinking about that back in September and thought, you know, maybe I should go poking around and see what's what I can find. And uh, holy cow, there is a whole slew of uh, groups of people, civilizations, hundreds of thousands of people living inside the planet. Um, they don't have to worry about stuff happening on the surface. Some of them are very, very deep. Some of them are not very deep. Um, you know, five, six miles, if you have a big earthquake, uh, that's a dangerous place to be. <laughs> so, um, however, they are living at a frequency that they're kind of not affected by all the physical stuff that affects us. And, and so I've been doing a lot of visiting over the last uh, four months, and especially over November and December, um, going back again and again. Um, I had found this crystal city that I 
was like, what, how, how did I find that? <laughs> Trying to find that again on the way to try to find that. I found a whole bunch of other places. So there is a very, very rich um, uh, set of civilizations in the planet. What's happening on the surface, I'm now thinking, well, maybe we'll get an invitation if we can behave and, you know, get nice. Uh, maybe we'll get an invitation to come into some of those places that are inside, that are out of harm's way. If if we get into this whole cataclysm thing and and the big cataclysm, which is every 12,068 years, is only the big one. What I've discovered is that there are others that happen a, approximately every 6,000 years. And then there are other smaller ones that happen approximately every 3,000 years. And then there are smaller ones that happen maybe every 1,800 years so or 1,500 years. So it's like, wow, how, how have we, you know, how have we survived um, and multiplied like we have and, um, and not seen this? And it's mostly because the truth about our history has really been hidden. So we don't know that, and the um, the whole the right now we're in kind of a bind um, because we have a whole lot of factors that are pushing us. And there, on on good days, I think to myself, that's good. Let those things keep pushing us because we need to make some changes. Boom. So, yeah. And I see a question here. Another question by Tiffany. What a frequency machine help us raise our frequency so that we can see the newer. Um, I, nah, not the kind of frequency machines that we have uh, now. Uh, most of the frequency machines out there are for healing purposes. Um, there's a lot that we don't know about those. Uh, we might be doing some damage in a very hidden way that we don't know about. Um, however, they're the best thing we have going because the, um, the whole pharma, pharma, can I say that word? <laughs> the, uh, medical industries are not, uh, very, they're not very good for us. Okay. They try and the people in them are good hearted. Most of them, but there's a lot of side effects that are really awful. So um, if we had, if, let me give you a little story. I have a friend who had some brainwave equipment and he came to visit and he um, was talking about um, accelerated teaching and learning because we are both, he and I are both specialists in accelerated teaching and learning. And um, I, I can't remember exactly what, triggered it but we're all sitting at the picnic table and he's talking about getting all the students in a class into a state of absolute and utter flow um and and so he's talking about their brain waves and he was testing their brain waves but it, when he put the equipment on it interrupted the flow and <laughs> all this stuff and my husband said to him well you ought to um, test her because he pointed at me because uh, she can do some stuff that I, I've never seen anybody else do. And so uh, Brian said, okay, let's do that. Let's, you know, I'll get the equipment out. He was on his way to, I think, New Mexico um, and he stopped here. So we get the equipment out. And before that, I thought that I was, um, when I would get into a really deeply altered state, um, I thought that I, and, and was channeling. Okay. So I do some channeling. I don't like to say that because, um, people don't really understand, I think what that really is. Um, but I thought I was really dropping down into alpha or theta, and that turned out to be not the case at all. What was happening was that I was splitting my entire frequency set so that my body stayed in alpha but my consciousness was up in gamma um, 30 and 40 cycles per second and that turned out to be such a shock not only for me but for him 
and for other researchers because um, it's not very often that people can get into gamma, which is 30 to 40 cycles per second, and stay there. They can hit it for a minute and then they drop out. And not only could I go into it, I could operate from that. I could move around back to dealing with every day and then go right back into gamma and I could go and I could stay there for hours um, and could move into it at will. And so that was like, oh, I didn't, I didn't realize until I saw that the results of that equipment, um, what was actually happening. And, and so it was like, okay, so we're, I'm moving up in frequency where I thought I was moving down. But if you move up in frequency and you take and your body moves up in frequency, then that is quite disruptive to a lot of systems in the body. Um, and so there's a splitting. <laughs> there's a, I, I don't know how else to put it. There's a splitting of frequencies that has to happen. Or I'm going to say, we have to learn how to raise consciousness while keeping the body utterly relaxed. And that's, uh, I, I, some people have said, well, can you show me how to do that? And I'm like, well, um, you explain to me how you learned how to breathe and I'll tell you how I learned how to do that. Cause I don't really know how I do it. It's just, it's natural. It's natural. And it involves, um, a change in breathing. It involves allowing the body to move into a different mode a little bit. Um, it involves shutting off my eyes. Um, you need to shut down your eyes so that there is no visual stuff happening that involves the physical plane. And when that happens, when I shut off my eyes, then um, I move up into gamma. So um, it's a way of being. It's a natural way for me to operate. Um, some days I, uh, you know, the weeks will go by and I won't bother doing that. And then um, I'll get on a project and um, I'm in it all the time. The difficulty is that you don't always bring all of the information from one place to the other. So stuff happens in the physical and you're like, oh, I missed that completely. Or stuff happens in gamma um, and later you recall that and go, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Um, so it's that kind of thing. So uh, let's see. We have a cedar. Oh, hi, cedar. <laughs> um, the best possible company at 3 a.m. in Oz. Sleeplessness. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, it is. You're right. Um, if you wake up at 3 a.m. or 4 a.m., try, you know, moving your consciousness up and, and try look, just try looking out the top of your head. OK, um, you don't have to move your eyeballs up there. You just have to move your vision up there. <laughs> and there's a difference. So, um, OK, is there technology to regulate our frequencies? where it would take us to new earth. Um, yes, there is. And some of that technology regulating our frequencies was very recently shut off. Um, and so we have a window, at least a small time here to be able to really play with frequencies. However, I, let me just put a, you know, a bug in your ear here, Britt. Um, uh, the new earth is only one possibility. There are so many other civilizations that are out there that you might not be interested in the new earth if you had experienced or visited a few of the others. Um, give yourself directions when you go to sleep to have an experience in another um, civilization. And keep giving that same direction over and over until you have that dream. You'll think it's a dream. It's actually going to be an experience. And you remember it. So you can begin teaching yourself to go out there 
and um, and look around, and you might find someplace other than the new earth. So um, the new earth is really quite beautiful. It's uh, very lovely. Um, a lot of things are different. Uh, there's a crystal city that I finally managed to find again. <laughs> um, and, uh, and the first time I went to that crystal city, um, I couldn't, I could barely see anything. I couldn't quite get the whole frequency. And, and so it was, I knew it was, you know, I was on a street and all the buildings were made of crystal, it's crystal. And I'm walking along and I see an insect. <laughs> and I'm like, what are you doing here? <laughs> what, a, uh, where am I? You know, I had this kind of a moment of shock. And then I'm looking closely at that insect. And I'm seeing that it's made of these gorgeous colors, almost like mother of pearl and crystal colors and gold. And, and it was crawling up a wall. And, and I walked right up to it and I have a long established habit of communicating with mother nature. And I said, what the heck are you doing here? And, and this bug, which I couldn't identify, said, um, I'm doing what all bugs do here. And I said, and what is that? <laughs> you know, and he said, or it said, um, searching for flaws in the material that would prove to be a problem down the road. And I was like, what? <laughs> so, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> so I came away from that. It, it knocked me out of that whole um, frequency that I was at. And, and so I was like, what? And later on, um, what I, I met some people and they said, yeah, the bugs here are responsible for finding flaws in the material in the same way that the insects in your world are responsible for finding plants that are unhealthy and don't have a healthy frequency. And I was like, oh, okay. So the components of our world exist in a lot of places, but they have different functions. They have different consciousness. Um, they have different work and different purpose, and they're all very important. So, um, so just keep that in mind. You might want to go somewhere else. <laughs> uh, let's see. Dan says, I've found energetic imprints can be impressed upon the consciousness of others to help coax them into new ways of perceiving. Maybe could that help? Yeah. Yeah, it could. Um, one of the things that is so common, so common among the advanced races is the ability to take a print of your consciousness and save it. Just like we copy a document or, you know, some other thing, um, they imprint systems of consciousness, which is an arrangement of frequencies. And if something were to happen to you and they really wanted your consciousness to continue working, they would just put that in another body. So um, is that a painful transition? Yes, because the consciousness that they have saved, that they have copied, is going to interact with the body they put it into and it's going to overrule that uh, body, the existing body and change everything and there's there's some pretty ferocious pain there as everything adjusts but then you're good to go and you keep going so um cat's eyes <laughs> i like that name i'm uh, really enjoying your book uh, getting well naturally oh good and my friend who is making the move wow to come off her many meds is uh roving to be reading it soon too is is uh thinking about reading it soon too so thank you for all your hard work you're welcome you're welcome i really um i, I really am excited that so many people are reading that nowadays because it is something that we you can't hold higher consciousness if you're not really 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 healthy 
Um, and we have so degenerated, um, deeply degenerated at so many levels, physically, mentally, emotionally, um, spiritually. Um, we're just barely hanging on. And we need to be more robust. So, yeah, keep reading. Encourage your friend. <laughs> okay. Um, Slonerific Heart <laughs> says... What are three of the most efficient ways and practices you would recommend to help raise our frequency and consciousness? Um, three of the most efficient ways. Well, I'll share what I did, okay? Um, probably the most efficient way is kundalini, but that's not advisable, okay? So let's just say that's number one, and it rewires you completely from head to toe, but... Um, that's something you have to pretty much earn. I think. Well, I can't really say that because I sure didn't earn it. Um, it. It's a gift. It's it's a gift that happens if you accidentally happen to line up with the energies of the source. At, then it's going to move through you. You know, I, I've said this before. I'll say it again for whoever might happen to be listening that hasn't heard it. Kundalini is like being like you're a submarine and you're down at a thousand feet. Um, you know, and somebody pokes a hole in the submarine. That water doesn't say, oh, there's a hole. Should we go in? What should we do? You know, as soon as you poke that hole or as soon as the weakness in the material appears, that energy is flooding through you and it's like a freight train and it sounds like a freight train. And, um, and as it moves through, it hits every single chakra all the way up the spine and you are changed overnight. You're different. You're clairvoyant, you're clairaudient, clairsentient, in and out of the body, um, reading minds in two or three places at once. And that's just the beginning. So it's really a, uh, how do I say, it's a situation where kundalini is very powerful, but there are some, uh, some things that you really have to be careful with. I thought for sure I was going to burn up. Um, it is an electromagnetic charge change in the body, and the heat that that generates is, is ungodly. Um, and it's frightening, to be quite honest. Um, and your heart needs to be in good shape. You, your heart's going to go 200 beats a minute um, in that experience. And, and it doesn't just happen one time. It often happens a whole bunch more times. So um, you need to be in good shape uh, physically. So that's number one. The second thing, after Kundalini, and, um, and I'm... So many, I'm just a basket case because so many of the perceptual habits I had um, were just blown away or they weren't working. And there were so many new ones um, that I had to learn to meditate. And and what I realized was if, um, if you want to learn to get quiet, which is what I call passive meditation, then you pretty much first have to do active meditation. Because what happens for most people, they sit down, they get very quiet, they start breathing. And after a minute or two, their mind is like, nye, 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 nye. and they're all over the place. And, and so it really is important to, um, to be able to do active meditation, which is you say, okay, what is the, the most important thing for me to work on in order to be able to raise my consciousness. What is the most important thing? Or why does that thing keep coming? I wasn't very graceful um, in the beginning. It's like, you know, damn it. Why does that keep interfering? Well, you know why? Because as soon as you get quiet and you're sitting there, eyes closed, and you're, you know, trying to relax, consciousness is going to present you with the next thing you need to work on in order to raise your frequency. 
And so this issue kept coming up and I kept pushing it away and trying to distract and, and, you know, trying to ignore that. And finally, <clears throat> what I discovered was just focus on that. And as I focused on that, I began to come at it from, you know, nine different ways, 10 different ways. Now, why did I, why did that happen? You know, why do I feel so bad about that? Or why does that keep coming up? Or what is the clue in there for me, et, et cetera. And you keep on going back to that thing, whatever it is, that event usually, <clears throat> or it's an interaction. And you, and you keep on looking at that until you get to the root of A, what you decided about that. And B, is that still valid? Or do you need to change that? And C, what's the gift? What is What did you understand from that? What did you learn from that? And, and that, I think, brings me, and, and I'll stop here in a minute, Bracca, because I want you to get a word in edgewise in case um, you want to say something. Um, one of the things that I have run into over the past 43 years of since Kundalini is people saying to me, well, how can, how can I do that? How can I get some of that? How can I make that happen for me? Um, how did you learn all that stuff? Um, and what I think is really, really important, it's the key to everything, is your experiences. I learned to take every single relationship and every single experience and then every single interaction and then every single word and examine that to see what can I learn from that. So it's my own experiences that have taught me how consciousness works, what's important, um, all the stuff that I've learned. I've gotten from my everyday life nothing special. It's just a different way of approaching the everyday. And so I, I want you to, whoever's out there thinking that something special needs to happen, nothing special needs to happen except that you change how you see what you're doing and you start using that as your educational material. You don't have to wait for the sun to descend on your head. You don't have to wait for the, you know, the skies to open up and voices to say, blah, blah, blah. None of that. It's all in your everyday experience. And, and that's really, <clears throat> that's really where it's at. And, and so once I discovered that every single thing I was going through had a gift in it, I was a greedy beady. <laughs> I wanted the gift. And so I started like, okay, you know, why, why did he say that? And then why did I say that? Um, or, you know, there was a period when I was arguing with my husband from time to time. We didn't argue very much at all, almost never. But we would have these discussions that we would come to an impasse. And I would think later, we've had that same discussion over and over and over and it never goes anywhere and we both end up backing away because we are giving one another space what is why do we keep going there so um so i got to the point where i thought okay i'm going to um pay close attention to the conversation and sure enough i would recognize a trigger word that would open another pathway, another window, another whole set of feelings and emotions. And I would say, oh, there it is. That's the trigger. Um, and then, or I would, I would notice that at this point, <clears throat> our conversation would detour into something not very productive. And then if I kept on going back to that conversation, I would see that trigger word or that trigger concept, or sometimes it was a tone. Um, and then I would learn to recognize that, but I still couldn't manage it. And so about the third or fourth time that I recognized that's where there's the trigger, you know, there's the tone. Okay, I'm not going to respond like I usually respond. 
And then there's the question of, well, how are you going to respond? So, you know, so then you try out, well, what if I try this? Oh, that didn't work. Well, next time, what if I try that? And you hit upon something that you discover is truth. You just tell your simple truth. And, and you stop defending. And what you can watch sometimes is they keep right on going as if they didn't notice that you're not participating in the discussion. And, and eventually they get it. Eventually they get it. Um, and so there's, you learn that every single word comes out of your mouth is powerful. It's the power to change where people are going and what they're thinking and feeling, including yourself. So, um, and we have not done that kind of deep work. I call that root work, getting down to the roots of the problem um, and changing it until, and so that, so let me go back to the meditation scene. That's active meditation. Coming back to that argument, that fight, that discussion, and examining that from every single angle um, over and over and over until you can change the outcome. And then one of the things that that teaches you, A, is how to change the outcome. And B, it leaves you a little more peaceful inside. And so I spent 40 years doing root work on myself, examining this taking responsibility for what I was saying, what I was doing, what I was thinking, how I was behaving. Um, and it leads to consciousness and an awakened consciousness. So the active meditation of saying, okay, this keeps coming up. You know, it's not just my mind wandering. Um, you know, that is really the secret um, to getting somewhere, to get into a mindset where you say, okay, I'm just going to be absolutely silent. And still, um, if you've got a whole bunch of biases and you have a whole bunch of uh, perceptions that are uh, habitualized, then you're going to end up, you're not going to get anywhere. Just getting silent doesn't do anything. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, it, in a few cases, if you meditate five hours a day, every day for weeks and months, you can trigger Kundalini. You will. Um, but I, I didn't have five hours a day or six. I, I didn't have any time at, you know, and, and eventually my meditation became every breath, every step of every day is my meditation. So, um, the bottom line, the rule, know thyself, you know, first you know your body. What does it need? What does it not like? How do you restore your own vigor? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then what are you doing with your consciousness? What are you doing with your, your emotions? Your emotions are your frequencies. Why do you keep going to those or reconfiguring to those uh, frequencies that produce that emotion? Um, those kinds of things. So eventually you clean yourself up. And you're kind of like an empty vessel at that point. <laughs> so, so that's the long answer for getting to, well, that was two of the three. Um, I think the third one is technology. Uh, I, we do in our, in the places, that, in my people, which are not from here, um, we do have technology and, and we do have substances that maintain exquisitely high consciousness. Some of those are in the clothing. Some of those are in the food that is eaten. Um, and some of that is in the environment that we build. It, you know, people are they're thinking that spirituality is just something they're going to do in themselves. That is not the case. It is everything that you surround yourself with. Everything. So... Um, so Catherine, Catherine, hi, Catherine, says uh, decades of work. Yeah. Um, well, I'm hoping that you'll be able to learn um, I, as much as I can teach. Man, I'm, I'm wanting to teach it because we really need to go to a place where um, we can create a different world without the competition, 
We are wired for cooperation. What are we doing with this whole co competition thing? Um, that is not healthy. And it just brings us to breakdown. So, yeah. So go ahead, Brock. Uh, take a, I'm taking a breath. <laughs> take a minute to ask whatever, you know, do you want to go in a different direction? <clears throat> oh, I can't hear you. There we go. Well, first of all, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. You're welcome. Yeah. So beautifully and just being so generous with everything. You have such a generosity of spirit. Yeah. You. Well, you, give... you know, yeah. somewhere along the line, when you begin to know yourself, what you realize is that you're made of love and you mm -hmm. end up falling in love first with yourself and then with everything and everybody. Yes. It doesn't matter if it's a, you know, a door that doesn't quite fit in its door jam. You're like, oh, I'm sorry that you just don't, you're out of shape and you don't fit. Um, or a, a bug crawling across your bathroom floor, um, you know, or whatever. You're just in a place of love. So, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. So we could maybe do a couple more questions. Okay. Um, you know, it, it's... Uh, I, I think it's, we've been at an hour already. Oh my God. I did show up for a whole hour. <laughs> it flies. The time flies with you. We're out of time. In okay. You. Yeah, completely. It's a different dimension. Yeah. But yes. Right. Uh, would you take a couple more questions? I please? will. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So um, Tashi says, don't we already have beings living inside our planet? Heck yeah. A lot of them a lot of them and they're at different levels of development um, some are still physical but they're very very peaceful some are fourth dimension some are fifth some are sixth uh, and then there are others who just come and go um, yeah we do we have an amazing amazing assortment of people living inside the planet so um so Radhika says, how does one reconcile the willpower of the individual vis-a-vis -vis the willpower of the divine? That is a good question. So we have free will um, and we can choose. There's really only two choices. Um, and you could say one is love and the other is hate. Or you could say um, one is pleasure and the other is pain. Or you could say one is... Um, good and one is evil they're all the same choice you either align with the source which is if you've ever if you guys ever have a chance to experience source you wouldn't even consider aligning with anything else it is a mind-blowing paralyzing I, it's, there's no words that can explain that can say what that experience is like. Um, however, the love, the satisfaction, the completeness that is experienced in that state is, is the big draw. Why would you go anywhere else and experience anything else? Why? You wouldn't. You, you wouldn't even consider it after having that experience. Um, and it just, it's the kind of love that can't be expressed in words it's a feeling state that um is it's a gift beyond measure oh my gosh <laughs> so that's the choice and there really is only one choice you can choose to align with um evil or with hate or some people call it the dark side but you're going to be uncomfortable and you're always going to be running and you're always going to be looking over your shoulder and you're always going to be afraid of death um, be, there's just no, there's no real choice. We have a free will, but it's a choice to align with good or evil, with love or hate. And, um, and I think one other thing I would say is free will is, um, you're supposed to learn from your experiences, what to choose and what not to choose. And the human brain is only wired for two things, pleasure and pain. That's it. Everything else Everything is a derivative of either pleasure 
which is love or pain, period. So you're in, why? Why is that so? Because you're supposed to move toward pleasure and the pain is to teach you to move away. Let go of that. When somebody produces pain constantly in your life, you need to put some distance between you and them. You need to detach a little bit. So, and that's hard to do sometimes. So, um, oh yeah. Yeah, that's right. I think uh, we just put up a thing on free will um, on my channel. So um, do we have willpower? Yeah, we have a lot of will. We have a lot of power. Um, why don't we use it? Because we just don't know how to focus it. <laughs> that's the whole thing right there. Um, let's see. The Reluctant Channeler. Hey, that sounds like me. Um, you just mentioned Crystal Cities. Yeah. I meditated recently and came to understand Hartford, Connecticut may be one. Is there a way to verify? Uh, the Crystal City is really, um, I don't know where that was, would be correspond on earth. I had the impression that it was in the mountains. I don't know. I don't think Hartford, Connecticut is in the mountains, but it's not in this dimension. So it's uh, at least a fifth dimensional place. So, um, however, I, you know, I don't know how many of you understand this. You can stay right here and raise your frequency and you won't see any of the physical stuff that's here that I, I can't even say that. You won't see a lot of the ugly stuff that's here. You'll only see the beautiful. Um, you raise yourself a little further and a little further. Pretty soon you're not seeing what's happening in the physical realm at all. So it's just like being on another planet or another channel. You change the station. It's a whole new setting, whole new action, whole new information. So um, not everyone is meant to see the new earth. It is so hard to understand that when there are people on this plane that we love so much that will not transcend with us. Is this true? Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, people have to choose. Um, you can't, you can't be, you won't be welcome. You won't be allowed. I, I'll share a little experience. I got, this was back in September, maybe last September. <clears throat> I went to the new earth and I was upset about something. I was so upset. I can't remember what I was upset about, but I thought I'm going to the new earth. I landed and there were several beings there immediately. They said, stop. You can't come here like that. And, and I was like, what do you mean? I have a house here. And their response was go back where you came from. I was so insulted and so embarrassed and, and very quickly learned that you don't go, you can't take all your crap to those dimensions because they're all operating telepathically and they know everything that's going on in that place. And when I thought I was going to run away and pout, <laughs> you know, and be a, you know, a 3D human, um, they were right there. Nope, you're not coming here with that attitude. Um, go away, you know, go back where you came from. When you are in a better mind, that was what they said, you may come back. And it's a discipline. You discipline yourself to not get into all that anger. And in order to do that, you have to do the root work to figure out what is making me angry. Why do I think the world has to be the way I think it has to be? You know, um, et cetera, those kinds of things. Good question. <laughs> uh, let's see. So that woman, Glucks Klee, is all, seems the only chosen one. We might all die too. It, to me, it sounds like this. Heck no, I'm not going alone. <laughs> what do you think I'm teaching? I'm teaching day and night lately and writing because I want people to be I don't want to live in the kind of world we have. I think we're capable of changing what we've got 
and making it into something exquisitely beautiful, something thoughtful, something where there is no harm done to anything, period. So you can learn. Anybody can learn. If I did it, coming from where I came from, you know, wow. It's just a matter of learning to use consciousness and self-discipline. So, yeah, good comment. Was that Glucks or something like that? <laughs> um, guy is grow school. Well, that like, I've been feeling severely attacked for teaching this stuff. Uh, it's been very challenging. Um, well, it took a long time for my family to say, you know, well, here's my mom. <laughs> this is my mother. Um, you know, and they would often warn me, mother, you know, keep your eyeballs to yourself. Keep your ears shut. Keep your mouth closed. Don't say anything about what you do. Um, and, I, you know, yeah. So there's, it's been a long haul. If you don't have an attitude of being able to shift um, let me use an example here. Um, I had family uh, while I was married that were heavily, heavily Christian. And I was extremely comfortable with them. Why? Because all the things that they kept talking about, God this and Jesus that and, you know, da, da, da. And, and I can't even remember all the stuff that they said, and quoting verses from the Bible. Um I was very comfortable with that because I could see where that fit into the world of the awakened mind. They're using a language that is really uh, old school, but um, that language is still, it still has some validity. The Jesus within, they didn't know that they're talking about the Jesus within. That was how I felt whenever they used that term. They're, Jesus is a title not a person. Um, and that the whole story of Jesus um, is a wonderful story because in the past, the, you know, the civilizations were set up to teach everybody to reach the Jesus state. It was a state of consciousness. Um, and then along came the Christians and they sort of said, he belongs to us and we're going to have this whole story and, and, and they crucified somebody who was in the Jesus state, and they just called him Jesus. Um, but all of that, the whole history has been really jacked around. So, um, yeah, learn to be comfortable no matter who you're with. And listen, you know, and, and just, you know, don't try to preach. Don't try to teach. If they're not asking, they're not ready to learn. And that is the prime rule around teaching. Teach those who are asking the questions. That's not everybody yet, but by gosh, we've come a long way since 1980 when I started teaching and I didn't dare say what I was doing. So yeah, good luck. <laughs> um, Luli, Luli says, can Penny tell us some details about the white wall that she perceived? Um, and there's really nothing to say about the white wall. The white wall, when you are looking for information about somebody or some event or some future or something, and this white wall appears, that white wall says, stop, don't go any further, don't say any more, don't just be quiet. There's a huge lesson here, and you are likely to ruin it. If you say, if you go any further or say any more. And I learned that when I had a client, very um, good client, uh, financial woman out of Chicago and Harris Bank. And she had a daughter and, and she had, this woman had had a reading and she wanted her daughter to have a reading because uh, her daughter was moving. And so the daughter was really pretty sassy and pretty confident and pretty cocky. And, um, and so she, um, she's asking that she says, well, I'm moving to New York and, um, next week and I'm going to this and I'm going to that. And, you know, can you see if it's going to be a successful, uh, job? And, 
And I'm looking and I'm like, I don't, I said to her, I, I don't see you going to New York. And she got upset. And she, I'm going to New York and I don't care what you say. And I'm like, okay, fine. I'm just telling you that I don't see you going to New York. Maybe ever. And she was, ah, she was kind of pissy. And so, um, so then I go back to look again and this white wall came up. And, and I just heard this voice, stop. And I thought, okay, what? So then I, I just said to her, well, I see a white wall. I, I guess, you know, I didn't know what that meant at that time. She was the first one, and this was quite a long time ago. Um, and uh, about three days later, we get, done, we get done with the call, and about three days later, her mother called and said, could you pray for my daughter? She's in the hospital in critical condition. She was a runner running alongside the road and she got hit and the person took off and left her almost dead by the side of the road. And the only reason she did make it was because a car came along and it was a doctor and he saw this lump at the side of the road and said, that looks like a person and got out and called the ambulance and uh, it took her, I think, it took her months, six months, to learn to walk again. She was in the hospital for weeks and weeks, and you know. And so that white wall became um, the. I went back to to look at her future on my own, and what I saw then was that the white wall was a stop. She needs this lesson, and what I saw was that she had always been part of Russian royalty. And she was here and she was learning to um, that she wasn't invincible and that she needed to rely on other people and that she couldn't always do it her way. And that oh, there was a whole bunch of lessons tied up in that. And that poor girl um, had a rough time learning to walk again, learning to rely on nurses and doctors telling her what she could do and couldn't do relying on drugs she didn't want to um she just kind of thumbed her nose at all of that until that point so yeah the white wall i've seen it in other times other places um and i recently was i saw it most recently involving um us as a planet we are at a choice point and we have to choose, are we going with higher consciousness or are we going to cave in um, and become something we don't want to become? So, yeah. So last, let's make this the last one. Um, okay. Uh, Soul Light Radiance says, looks like our higher self is taking the decision to go to 5D and not we with our everyday mind. Does this mean that our choice has already been made? Um, I think um, one of the things that I have attended, one of the events that I have attended is this, uh, it's a huge, it's a meeting and it's huge. It's in a, it's in a space that I can't see the other end of that space. And there are millions, if not billions of people at this meeting, people from all over the galaxy. And there's a lot of focus on planet Earth because we were seeded for a particular reason. And when you seed a civilization, it has to survive and it has to thrive and it has to choose to raise itself, raise its consciousness into some of the higher frequency ranges. And, um, and at one of those meetings, um, the meeting was all about earth and whether or not we were making that choice. Um, and, and the, de and the decision was from this sector of people that were there from earth was, yes, we're going to do it. And, and I remember at the time, um, they said, if you choose that your government will be lost and your financial system will go down. And at the next meeting, we said, let it go down. So it's been slow. We've had a nicely, nice long chance to prepare and get ready. So we're, we're there. Okay. 
Wow. Thank you so much, Penny. Yeah. Can I, can I encourage everybody to check out Penny's amazing books? Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm reading them several times over. Oh, yes. yeah. Oh, <laughs> so packed. Oof, they're really packed full. Yeah. So uh, could I encourage you, if, maybe if uh, Daphne could put the links uh, uh, more publicly okay. for people to be able to find your materials, your wonderful diamonds and gold. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah re do some reading, you guys. I mean, a lot of people don't read anymore. I've yeah. kind of gone back to reading because there's so much uh, stuff on the internet that is it's not deep enough for me. It's not rich enough. Um, and it just kind of recycles the same stuff um, over and over. So, um, yeah, be sure you don't let go of reading. Yeah, that's, that's really important. an important thing. And not just because I'm a writer. It's because <laughs> reading is a skill that I, reading will develop as we develop. And our concept of writing will also develop as we develop. Um, yeah. You know, the language that we use here, there's a whole lot of, of words in some of these books. Um, look at this, you know, all these pages, all these words. Um, they, in, in a developed civilization, everything in this book could be, um, could be said in one symbol. Wow. So there's, a, you know, we're going somewhere as a civilization. Keep going. Don't forget about reading. Yeah. Oh, that's that's wonderful. Yeah, glad you said that. And also, um, I've had some wonderful feedback from the last meeting we had when you came oh, on. And somebody wrote, because the Zeolite helped him greatly. Maybe you'd like to refer to the Zeolite offer. Because yeah. it's the first time in 10 years he's been able to come off his psychotic medications. Oh, wow. Oh. So, just yeah, <laughs> very coming. good. Mm. Yeah, we do have a page on my website. If you go to pennykelly.com or consciousnessonfire.com, same website, just two different ways to get there. Um, there's a page that is um, got some specials on it, and you can still get some zeolite for $13 a bottle. I think it is 13 and some change. As um, opposed to, I forget if it's 50 or 70 or it's a lot more. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, start getting rid of heavy metals. Um, you don't want those in your system. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Penny, we could talk for hours. Thank you for the honor of being with you today. It's been a pleasure and a joy. Oh, and, thank you. Thank you for asking me. It's just been fun. So thank I appreciate you. it. I, I hope you'll consider coming back again. Sure, sure. Awesome. Yeah, I think we we might have to talk about food one of these times. Oh, please, please. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Maybe yeah. that's our next, next chat. Okay. All right. Real good. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you. for helping. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. 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 Thank you, everybody, for being here, for yeah. listening and yeah. for thinking, you know, just thinking, wow, well, OK, where do I go now? Yeah. Yeah. Thank OK. You. Thank you. Yeah.